The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome to the Old Time Radio Network Detective Stories, continuing America's love affair with private eyes. We now go back to the early days of radio and our imaginations with our feature presentation. Part 7, Wanted Kitty Stapleton. Was that the doorbell, Angel? Mm, it was. I suppose it's Inspector Rigby. Yes. It's about time he showed up again. Mm, afraid so. Could you reach over and flip me another cigarette, Angel? Thanks. Like another drink? No, I haven't uh, finished this one yet. Yeah. Mm, this is nice, isn't it? Mm, very. You and me beside the fire with the evening coming on. Mm, this... Nothing like a quiet domestic life. Quite. I've never noticed it before, Philip. But that doorbell has a distinctly raucous timbre. Raucous what? Timbre. Uh, tone. Oh, yes. Well, maybe you should get one of those whimsy contraptions which play the bluebells of Scotland when you press the button. <laughs> I don't like the bluebells of Scotland. No? No. It reminds me of cold schoolrooms. Oh, dear. Did you have an unhappy childhood, Heather? Not particularly. I never had enough to eat, though. Was that due to financial hardship or greed? <laughs> greed. I do believe that is the doorbell, Angel. Do you know, I believe it is. Shall we answer it? What do you think? Well, heads we do, tails we don't. Oh, that luck's out. It's heads. <laughs> I'll go... It's Inspector Rigby. Do come in, Inspector. Thank you. Philip, guess who's here? Father Christmas? Nearly right. It's Inspector Rigby. Oh, Inspector, this is a delightful surprise. Let me uh, take your hat and coat. I'm not staying. Oh, what a shame. Are you too deaf? Deaf, Inspector? I've been ringing that bell for nearly five minutes. Oh, have you? Odell thought he heard something, didn't you, Philip? I've no time to waste. Odell, are you ready to make this statement? Oh, sure, any time you say. Then we'll go along to the yard now. We shan't be interrupted there. Okay, I'll um, get my hat and coat. There's one thing I want to say to you, Miss McMorrow. Oh, yes? When I was here last, I told you that the body of Martin Sorrowby had been found. That's right. Have you mentioned it to Odell? Not yet. He came back only a short while before you arrived. Well, don't tell him. I want it kept a strict secret. We've managed to keep the press out. I don't want my plans upset. Do you understand? Perfectly. In case it might be too big a strain on you, I'll tell Odell myself at the right moment. Are you going to keep him long at the yard? That depends on him. Well, here we are. I'm ready, Inspector. Right, let's go. Bye, Angel. I'll call you later. Bye. The taking of my statement turned out to be more like a mild go of the third degree... Rigby sat me in a chair, turned a powerful reading lamp on my face and shot questions at me like a Tommy gun out of control. Sergeant Clayton took it all down in a big notebook and you could tell by the expression on his face that he was enjoying it about as much as a visit to the dentist. When I'd got to the end of my story, uh, hampered rather than aided by Rigby's method of interrogation, he switched off the lamp and gave me a cigarette. Then he went across and stood with his back to the fireplace and looked very thoughtful. Well, we have this. Kitty Stapleton, or Mrs. Prey, or whatever she calls herself, has been blackmailing Hampton and Sorrowby with material she got from her husband's case histories. An interesting idea. There's a moral in it. Never go to a psychoanalyst if he's got a good-looking wife. Quietly. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, why didn't she do the blackmailing herself? Why did she employ Ricky McMara? Have you any ideas about that, Odell? Well, she'd been waiting 15 years for the proof for something that showed that Hampton and Sorrowby were responsible for Maybrick's death. Finally, she got it. By becoming Frey's secretary and then marrying him and getting to know his code. That's pretty long-term planning. Pretty unscrupulous, too. Marrying a man so she could blackmail two other men. Quite. And after all that, Kitty Stapleton was taking no chances. 
She set McMara loose on them first to see if they were going to rise to the blackmail. At least that's how I see it. Mm, sounds reasonable, but why was McMara killed? Maybe he'd served his purpose. But McMara was strangled before he was put in the river. So was Marilyn Peters. It takes a good deal of strength to choke the life out of someone, you know. And Kitty employs a gorilla called Jay. He has a grip like an iron clamp. I know. I've felt it. Mm. Well, this is no time for speculation. We've got to find Kitty Stapleton. Pity you let her go. Yes, I've been kicking myself ever since it happened. But she fooled me completely. Perhaps when we've got a statement from her, we'll have the missing link between the blackmail and the murders. Perhaps we'll know who killed McMara, Marilyn Peters, and Sorrowby. What? Sorrowby? Is he dead? Yes, he was strangled about two hours ago. Strangled? The murderer left the front door open and a constable saw it and went in. We were on the scene very shortly after it happened. But I left Sorrowby a little over two hours ago. He was with Dr. Frey. I know. Now, Adele, I don't want you to mention this. Only six people know Sorrowby is dead. I don't want anyone else to know. Is that clear? Sure, but who were the six? The three of us here, the police surgeon, a constable, and Miss McMara. Nathan, go and get the car out. Yes, Inspector. Well, I don't think it'll be long before we have Kitty Stapleton, and then we'll see how far she bears out your statement, Adele. And what do you want me to do? Stay here? No, no, you can go, but keep in touch. Leave where you can be found with the switchboard. I may need you at a moment's notice. Okay. Well, good hunting. Uh, just a minute. Yes? Ever seen this before? What's that? Pay Philip Odell, 300 pounds, Martin Sorraby. Where'd you get this? It was found beside Sorraby's body. So what? This is the second check for 300 you had, isn't it? The other you got from Christopher Hampton. Well? When McMara was doing the blackmail, he got 300 pounds a time. Meaning? As you say yourself, there's a strong connection between this blackmail and the three murders. Well, that's all. Don't forget to leave your whereabouts with the switchboard. I went out into Whitehall and walked away thinking. Quite suddenly, I got scared. Things weren't running my way. It was all very well for me to think Inspector Rigby was an overzealous young fathead. But he was the law, and he had the whole force of the Metropolitan Police behind him to prove it. And if he'd fallen in love with the idea that I'd killed McMara in order to take over the blackmailing pitch, there wasn't anything I could do about it. I had done my best by giving him that statement, but just how good was that statement? I couldn't substantiate any of it. Everything that had happened had happened to me alone. Everything I'd been told had been told to me with no witnesses. If Hampton and Kitty chose to repudiate what they had told me, I'd be in a bad fix. Yes, I had good reason to be scared. What made it so bad was the knowledge that there was nothing I could do. You see, alone, I hadn't a hope of finding Kitty. I'd have to leave that to Rigby and sit tight and see what happened. Well, to be scared is bad, but to be scared and inactive is much, much worse. I ducked into a pub to see what two fast brandies would do. They restored a little confidence, so I went out and called up Heather. Hello? Heather, uh, this is Odell. I've uh, given my statement to Inspector Rigby, and he's turned me loose on society again. What should we do about it? I don't know. Any ideas? Plenty. Look, you remember the night all this started? You said that when it was over, we could have a night out. Well, it is over now, so far as we're concerned. Inspector Rigby does the rest. So, what about it? But it's past ten. I'm just going to bed. Well, look, change your mind. We can go to a nightclub. The, um, the Paradise Room's a good spot, they tell me. I'll be around in a cab in about half an hour. Okay. Oh, but don't bring a cab. We can use my car and make a proper night out. Your car? Yes, my car. I can't wait to see it. Well, this is quite a nice little car, Angel. Handles nicely, too. Yes, I bought it out of a legacy. I'm rather pleased with it. I didn't know you were such a good judge of engines. No, I didn't buy it for its engine. I liked the colour. It matched a suit I looked rather good in. Matched a suit. Uh. Hey, 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 where are we going? Around this corner. But 
I thought the Paradise Room was near Berkeley Square. It is. But you're heading for South Kensington, the opposite direction. Oh, and now what are you doing? Turning left. But that'll take us down to the river. All right, we'll go left again, huh? There. Is that better? Are you playing some little game of your own? Yes, I'm trying to find out if that yellow coupe behind is really following us. It is. Why? Now, that's a good question, Heather. I'm glad you asked that. We're going to find out the answer. But how? By letting it follow us. But aren't we going to the Paradise Room, then? We are. Someone wants to know where we're going, and it can't be Inspector Rigby, because I told him less than a quarter of an hour ago. If you ask me, I think you're having this night out under false pretenses. Do you? Why? You said this case was finished so far as we're concerned. But it doesn't look like it with that car following us, does it? Well, do you want to call the whole thing off and go home to bed? No, of course I don't. Philip? Hmm? You don't seem to be enjoying yourself. Don't I? No. You haven't spoken a word for the last half hour. It has been known for a man to enjoy himself without speaking, Angel. <laughs> Not a man like you. Oh, what's the trouble? Are you worried about something? Me? Worried? No, no, no. Of course not. Come on, let's, um, let's dance. <sighs> it's a good band, isn't it? Hmm, very. The floor's quite good for a nightclub. Yes, you can almost turn around on it. Oh, what the heck are we talking like this for? Like what? A pair of tongue-tied adolescents. The band's good, isn't it? Oh, awfully. Nice floor. Oh, awfully. Shouldn't be surprised if we have some rain. Oh, what's the matter with you? I'm thinking. Well, you've picked a fine time and a place for it, I must say. Oh, let's go and sit down and have some more of this lovely tongue-tied conversation. Now, wait a minute. I, I know this band leader. Maybe he'll play something that'll put me in a brighter frame of mind. Hi, Jerry. Oh, Philip O'Dell, what brings you here? A mistaken idea that he was in the mood for a night out. Oh, uh, Jerry, this is uh, Heather McMorrow. Heather, this is Jerry. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Philip thought you could play something to put him in a better mood. Well, sure. What'll it be? Jerry, do you know a little thing called How Little We Know? Hmm? Yeah, sure I do. The band's got a break, but I'll play it for you on the piano. Oh, thanks. Uh, come over and have a drink when you're finished. Oh, thanks. Coming up right away. How little we know. That could be our theme song, Angel. <laughs> could be anybody's. Mm, you're a cynic. No, it particularly applies in this case. We've done a lot of hard work on it, covered a lot of ground, found out a lot of things, and yet how much do I really know? So you haven't finished with it. I knew it. I'm still as far off knowing who killed your brother as I was when I went into it. But I thought you weren't interested in the identity of the murderer. Well, I am now. I'm very interested. If he isn't found soon, I'm going to find myself in a very awkward spot. Well, well, well. Well, 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 Mr. Hampton. A cozy little party. Do you mind if I join you? Oh, but certainly. <laughs> You're taking the night off, are you? Um, mind if I sit down? Of course not. Sit down. Oh, this is uh, Heather McMara, Ricky's sister. How do you do, Miss McMara? How do you do? I believe you were the cause of Mr. Adele getting mixed up in this terrible business in the first place. Oh, don't remind me of that, Mr. Hampton. I've been reproaching myself ever since. Do you uh, come often here, Mr. Hampton? Uh, no. No, this is my first time. You didn't happen to follow us here in a yellow coupe, did you? <laughs> I didn't. Parky and my man did. Uh, do you mind if he joins us? No, no, not at all. We could use a little of his inimitable joie de vivre. Good evening, Mr. O'Dell. You're a pretty good follower, Parkin. If you should ever need one, I dare say Inspector Rigby would give you a job. Thank you, sir. I'll remember that. You'd get on well with Rigby. He enjoys a touch of the sinister, too. <laughs> would that be a joke, sir? Yes, Mr. O'Dell is in festive mood, Parkin. Is he, sir? I wonder why. Exactly. I thought you were working for me, Mr. Adele. I thought you were going to find out who's been blackmailing me. Oh, but I have done. We're spending that 300 you gave me. Isn't it about time you told me that? 
man? Mm-hmm. It was uh, Kitty Stapleton. Kitty Stapleton? Or maybe you know her better as Mrs. Alexander Frey. Kitty Stapleton? Dr. Frey's wife? It isn't possible. Didn't you meet her when you went to see the doctor? No. I heard he'd married about three or four months ago. But, but I never saw her. She was never at the consulting room when I was there. Well, that's who was blackmailing you, Kitty Stapleton. I heard she'd left the country years ago. Well, this is a surprise. Hmm. What are you going to do about it? What can I do? I don't know. There's bound to be an inquiry. The police will want to know what, if anything, was in her contention that you killed Maybrick. Maybrick killed himself. That case is closed. Well, then, you've nothing to worry about, have you? The cops are after Kitty, they'll catch her, and she'll get a prison sentence for blackmail. That leaves you with nothing more to fear. Or uh, does it? Mr. Hamden, I think it's time for us to go. Oh, after his bedtime, is it? <laughs> That's right, sir. Come along, Mr. Hamden. Just a moment, Parkin. There's one thing more I want to know, Mr. O'Dell. Yes? Who killed McMara, Marilyn Peters, and Martin Sorabay? Well... Mr. Hampton, I have given up the case. Inspector Rigby's in charge now. He may be able to tell him. Although, personally, I should doubt it. Why? Well, strictly entre nous, uh, Rigby isn't too hot as a detective. Oh. Oh, I, I see. Well, uh, I'll be going. Enjoy yourselves. Thanks. Any time you want another job done. I hope I shan't come to that again. Good night, Miss McMahon. Good night. So... Mr. Christopher Hampton. He seems quite pleasant. A little on the hearty side, perhaps. I'd like to know what his relationship with Parkin is. Something odd there. Oh, hello, Jerry. Well, how'd you like the way I played How Little We Know? Oh, fine. Have you ever thought of taking up the piano professionally? <laughs> <laughs> like me to play it again? No, no, no. It's, um, it's out of date now. Oh, I don't know. It's one of those numbers that never dies out completely. No, I mean, it's out of date so far as we're concerned, Jerry. It's uh, not how little we know now, but how much. Uh, excuse me, sir. You are Mr. Philip O'Dell, aren't you? That's right. The, the gentleman who just left you, the, the red-faced gentleman. Mr. Hampton? Uh, yes, sir. He asked me to give you this. Oh, thanks. What is it? A note. I can see it's a note. What's it say? Oh, just give me a moment. On second thoughts, there is another job you can do for me. Will you call on me at 9.30 in the morning? C.H. Why didn't he tell you that when he was here? Maybe he didn't want to tell me in front of Parkin. Will you go? Maybe. But right now, I want a word with Inspector Rigby. I had to wait for those few words with Inspector Rigby. He wasn't in when I reached the yard. They said he'd be back in half an hour and offered me a dusty room to wait in, but I turned that down and went out into Whitehall where Heather was parked. I got into the car and we sat looking at the fog for a bit. Finally, she said, Let's go down to the embankment. It's a nice night for looking at the river. Well, in this fog. Oh, it isn't very thick. Yet. Besides, I don't think I like sitting right outside Scotland Yard. Okay, the embankment it is. Oh, this is the second time a night out has ended badly for us. Oh, is this one going to end badly, then? <laughs> it's going to end with a meeting with Inspector Rigby, isn't it? Lovers' meetings end in journeys with Inspector Rigby. Cleopatra's needle. Will this do? Sure. Sure, this is your party. Somber looking thing, isn't it? What? Cleopatra's needle. Perhaps it doesn't like the fog. Perhaps it's yearning for the sun. Where did it come from, anyway? I don't know. Oh, Egypt, I suppose. Why else should they call it after Cleopatra? One ought to know these things, you know. Ought one? Hmm. Here we are trying to find out who murdered your brother and two other people, 
And we don't even know where Cleopatra's needle came from, or why. I don't see the connection. Well, there isn't one. Well, then why mention it? No, just a subject for conversation. Why? Wouldn't it do as well if we just sat here, held hands and looked at the river? Well, what we can see of it. Mm -hmm, I guess so. All right. Let's do it. Here's my hand. Mm. You know, you haven't got your mind on this. I know. Why not? I've got the jitters. Why? I won't bite you. I'm not frightened of you, Angel. It's Inspector Rigby. Oh, he's a pompous young ass. I know, but he's still the law. And he's got it firmly fixed in his mind that I know something about these murders which I haven't disclosed. Oh, but that's nonsense. Look, there's something I haven't told you. When they found Martin Sarabi's body, they also found a check for 300 pounds made payable to me and signed by him. What? Well, this makes Rigby think that I've been doing the blackmail. And on top of that, he believes that the person who did the blackmail did the murders. Now, I've got no definite proof to put forward to counter that. Therefore, I am scared. So that's what's been the matter with you all evening. Oh, why didn't you tell me this before? Oh, why should I worry you? It's very sweet of you, but I wish you had told me. Quite suddenly, all the charm and excitement has gone out of this for me, Angel. The fact that I seem to have outsmarted myself doesn't make me feel very good. Philip, hmm? what are you going to see Rigby for? Well, I've got an idea... It may be an idea that'll land me in the clear. Oh, I hope so. I feel bad about getting you into all this in the first place. Oh, I went into it with my eyes open. Did you? Well, my vision was somewhat obscured by that perfume you were wearing. What was it called? Um, indiscretion. This is what comes of vanity. I was vain enough to think that I could make you help me instead of going to Ireland and now see what I've done. Angel, you didn't do it. I did it all on my fool self. I played it the wrong way, that's all. It's nice of you to say that, Philip, but it only makes me feel worse. I'll never, never try to make a man do what he doesn't want to do. Heather, now look, snap out of it, please. I didn't mean that. Look. Who's it? That big car, just drawing up behind us. Isn't that the lady in mink, Mrs. Frey? It is. Come on, we'll go and see what she wants. Hello. The lady in a fog again. Always the fog. One of these days, the fog's going to clear, Mrs. Frey, and then where'll you be? Mr. Adell, I want to talk to you. How did you know we were here? I've been following you ever since we left the Paradise Room. How did you know we were there? That isn't important. Uh, would you like to get in my car? There's more room in it than there is in yours. Have we any guarantee that your gorilla isn't going to drive off with us? Oh. Jay. Yeah, Mrs. Frey. Come here. Right. Jay, I want you to go for a walk. A walk? Yes. I want to be alone with these people. Okay. Where shall I walk to? There's some nice steps over there leading down to the river. Oh, is that meant to be funny? Only moderately. Walk up to Westminster Bridge and then come back. We'll be finished by then. Okay. Now, will you get in the car, Mr. Odell? Okay. After you, Heather. Oh, well, by the way, you haven't uh, met Heather McMara, have you? How do you do? Ah, I've heard a lot about you, Mrs. Frey. Have you? Yes. You've made quite a big impression on Philip. Uh, what did you want to talk to us about, Mrs. Frey? Well, as you probably know, the police are after me. You should have come with me when I asked you to. I was rather offended when you skipped off over that roof. Yes, I'm afraid I didn't do the right thing. You didn't. You made everything look much worse by bolting. That's what my husband says. You've told him, then? Yes. Did he know anything about your blackmailing Hampton and Sorrowby? No. I told him about that, too. How did he take it? And he was very upset. Yes, I should think he would be. It was fortunate for you that both Hampton and Sorrowby were patients of your husband. Or uh, did you fix that? Well, Hamden came of his own accord. That gave me the idea. I persuaded Sorab's doctor, GP, to recommend my husband. 
How did you persuade him? Oh, I don't think it would be necessary to go into that, but that isn't the point. My husband's waiting to see you. Me? Yes. He wants to tell you something. What? The truth about how George Maybrick died. He knows the whole story from what Sorrowby and Hamden told him during their consultations with him. Well, what good does he think that'll do? Well, he thinks you'll know then who killed Ricky McMurrah but... and Marilyn Peters. Well, why doesn't he go to the police? I persuaded him not to. Why did you do that? I'm afraid. You've no reason to be. You uh, haven't killed anyone, have you? No, no, no. But they'll arrest me for blackmail. Well, they'll do that anyway. Not if you agree to do what I suggest. You're not offering me another bribe, are you? No. Well, at least not money. Look, your whole interest in this is to find the murderer, isn't it? Well? My husband can tell you. Where's the catch? He thinks that you could persuade the police to drop the charge of blackmail against me in consideration of the assistance he'll give you in finding the murderer. I see. Why doesn't he make that proposition direct to Inspector Rigby? He met Inspector Rigby this afternoon. And he doesn't think Inspector Rigby would play? No. I see your husband's no mean psychologist after all. Will you do it? Well, I don't know that I can. Oddly enough, Inspector Rigby doesn't usually do what I suggest. It might work, Philip. It would get you out of your trouble, you know. But how do we know Mrs. Fraser on the level? She may be trying to pull something. I'm not. Really, I'm not. What I don't get is, why are you giving up now after 15 years? I'm afraid. Of what? Of being arrested for murder. Why? If you're innocent. Please come. Time's getting so short. Well, Heather, you're a woman. Is she on the level? Oh, you know more about her than I do. You decide. Okay, I'll take a chance. We'll come, Mrs. Ray. Thank you. I'll call Jay. Jay? Come in. We're going to Wimpole Street now. Hurry. Anything's better than walking about in this fog. Well, Angel, keep your fingers crossed. Anything can happen now. That was Wanted Kitty Stapleton, the seventh episode in the serial Lady in a Fog by Lester Powell, with Robert Beatty as Philip O'Dell and Sheila Manahan as Heather McMara. Kitty Stapleton was played by Mary Wimbush, Inspector Rigby by Edward Jewsbury, and other parts by members of the BBC Drama Repertory Company. Production by Martin C. Webster. <laughs>